What is church? Is it a building? With some pews? A piano? And stained glass? Or is it something more? 2,000 years ago, the church was born. It wasn't made up of the famous, the rich, or the powerful. It was made up of everyday people who passionately believed in the message of Jesus. It was the beginning of a revolution of love and freedom that would change the world forever. In 369 AD, the church built the first hospital as a place to care for those who cannot care for themselves. Today, the church is the largest single provider of healthcare in history. The church was the first to stand up for the rights of children, creating the first and largest orphanage system in the world. 100 out of the first 110 universities in America were founded as Christian institutions. Places like Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, and Princeton. Much of the world's greatest art, architecture, literature, and music has been shaped by the church. But the impact of the church isn't just ancient history. Today, the church is stronger than ever and continues to impact every corner of the world. Over 300,000 churches in America and almost 5 million churches around the world stand ready to be instruments of change, to do what governments could never do. Every day, the church brings food and fresh water to millions of people across the world. It has a renewed passion to help widows and orphans and fights to free slaves in every part of the world. It stands ready as a first responder on the scene to provide relief for victims of disaster. The ripple of Jesus' impact can be clearly seen and felt in the church today. And it's made up of people like me and you. Today, you didn't just come to a building. You came to a revolution 2,000 years in the making. The world is facing as much trouble as ever. But we are not afraid. We were created for such a time as this. We will continue to do what we've always done. Proclaim the message of Jesus to help a world that needs him so desperately. Welcome. 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 Welcome to church. Good to welcome you this morning as we come to worship together today. Uh, the Lord's going to bless us with some rain today, and that's okay. That We need the rain. I do want to share with you a couple of things happening today. First of all, we were hoping Miss Irma Grigg could be with us today. Uh, she celebrated her 96th birthday uh, this week, so we're happy for her. Her daughter's here, Susan's here, but Miss Irma was too not able to make it this morning. But you tell her we wish her a very happy birthday. Everybody, let's clap for Miss Irma. <laughs> Miss Irma is our oldest church member. Uh, so let's remember her. Also, if you remember Kenny Finters and his family in your prayers, his father passed away last night. Uh, so if you'll please uh, be praying for Kenny. Uh, also, tonight, we're going to have the men's fellowship dinner. I hope you all come and enjoy that tonight. We're going to have barbecue and all kinds of other good things to go with it. So we look forward to that as we celebrate together at 6 o'clock. All men and boys are welcome to that, uh, to our fellowship tonight. So you come and join us at 6 o'clock. Then we have uh, teenagers coming up in a couple of weeks, so I wanted to make you aware of that for our senior adults. Uh, you're welcome to join us on Tuesday, March the 15th, and we're going to have a special guest to lead us in our program that day. Uh, one of our former members, Miss Caroline Thompson, is coming back to share with us that day, and she's going to share with you the meaning of the Passover meal, the Seder. So that will be uh, very interesting to hear her share that. So we look forward to those two things that are happening really soon. Uh, if you would take notice of the other things happening in your bulletin and the things that are upcoming, and uh, we do... Uh, look forward to our fellowship tonight especially. So if you would, let's join together in prayer and then we'll move forward in our service. Father, thank you so much today for our time to share together in worship. Thank you for the blessings this week that you have given us. Thank you, Lord, for the rain that is coming. Lord, thank you for Miss Irma Grigg celebrating her 96th birthday. Father, I pray that you'll continue to take care of her and thank you for her children that take good care of her. And Lord, we just trust her to you every day. Father, we thank you for the blessing that she is to us and to her family. Lord, we also pray today for Kenny Fenters and his family and the loss of his dad. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll lift them up and carry them through this time. Father, now be with us as we enter into worship. And Father, we ask your blessings on this hour. For it's in your name. Amen.
burden weighing heavy Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus And do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing And you're desperate for some healing Let me tell you about my a tiny bag of chips and made y'all share them. This week I thought I'd make up for it. Do you think I made up for it? A little bit? Yeah. In Sunday school this morning they asked me, are you only going to give us one chip again today? (laughs) No. So, um, how many of you like candy or like suckers? Dum-dums are fun. You do, yes. So, dum-dums are fun because it's a big bag and it has a bunch of different flavors. So, let me see. Who likes this one is blue raspberry. You like blue raspberry? Sour apple? <laughs> you like sour apple? Awesome. Oh, did I hit you? Sorry. Bubble gum? Ew. Ew. I knew we were going to get there soon. <laughs> Cherry? Oh, Anna Grace. Root beer? Ugh. Strawberry? Um, lemon lime? Ooh, I like it. I like it. Mm, sure. Strong. Fruit punch? <laughs> Watermelon? Oh, we got one. Does everybody have one? Which kind do you like? Cherry. Cherry? Oh. Strawberry. 
seriously. Oh, Anna Grace gave it to her. How it's very sweet of you. So, you got one? Okay. So, the fun thing with this, you have a lot of different flavors, but some of you got some flavors that I do not like. Brute beer? Seriously? I would like to drink. Really, like, ugh. And the only other one that's worse in this whole bag is the grape. Ew. Ew. Oh. Yeah. It tastes yeah. like... Yeah. You love it? Well, wait a second. Okay, 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 listen. So, I would rather you pull all my eyelashes out than for me to eat this grape sucker. But some of you are sitting here saying, what were you saying about the grape sucker, Georgia? I love it. You love it, right? It is nasty. So we got it. one that's smiling, yay, and then one that's like, ugh, it's gross, and y'all live in the same house. Oh my goodness. But I wanted, the reason I brought these, because I wanted us to make a point, that some people like things one way, and some people like them a little bit a different way. But what we have to understand, if we kind of think of these suckers maybe as like people, God calls us to love everyone. In John chapter 15, um, starting with verse nine, it says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have, t- listen, this is what's really important. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And if you keep going on to verse 17, it says, This is my command love each other. Now, how many of you, maybe even like your brother, your sister in your own house, or maybe a friend at school, maybe a classmate that's a little bit difficult to deal with, there are people that you are just like, oh, just kind of make, maybe aggravate you a little bit, or it's hard for us to love them. God is telling us in these verses that we should love each other. We should show them that love. And it's not just because that would, it would make you a nice person, which is true, but God's telling you that when you do that, you are remaining in his commandments. And it says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy, with God's joy, with the joy that Jesus has and he can give us. So when we listen, we can do, or when we, do, when we love other people the way that God tells us to, we can have his joy. It's not always gonna be hard, but when we love others, we are showing them God's love that's in us. So, I do not like a grape sucker. It does taste like cough syrup. It's really gross. Anything grape flavored, yucky, yucky, yucky. But there are people that I have to, maybe if I'm not getting along with them, I have to pray and ask God to help me so that I can show them God's love and so that I can understand what I'm doing wrong too and show God's love through the way that I treat those people. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you that you give us a way um, to follow after your commands, your commandments, God, and that you tell us it's not... um, for, any, for anything for other people to see how we are, um, God, but it's for us to really have your joy. And God, I think that when we have that joy and it overflows in our life, God, we understand people more. We can um, see who they are. And maybe even if it's something that we may not get along with or a difference that we have, Father, that we can see that they are created by you and in your image. And God, that we can love them because you love them as well. So God, help us to remain in your love in the way that we treat other people. And God, help us to show that love in, the, in our actions. God, we love you. We praise you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't you think Allison should have to eat that grape lollipop to show the kids how to love others? <laughs> good, good children's sermon. Uh, I would like for us to pause for a moment and pray for the people of Ukraine. If you've been watching that on the news this week, it is so sad to see what's happening as Russia tries to move in and take over Ukraine. And innocent people are having to run and to hide and are getting caught in the crossfire. And it's just not right. So let's pray for those people now. Heavenly Father, we lift up the nation of Ukraine to you this morning. We lift up the people there. 
We lift up the men, the women, and the children, Lord. Father, the men are having to fight to protect their land. Even some of the women are choosing to fight. And Father, the children are just scared. Father, they're having to hide in subway systems. They're trying to get out of the country, if at all possible. Lord, it it hurts to see these things happening to them. Father, I would pray that you would protect them and watch over them. Father, that you would provide a way for them to get to a safe place. And Lord, we just pray that your will will be done in the situation in Ukraine. Father, that you will deal with Russia in your time, Lord. Father, we just, again, trust these people that are hurting to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to do something this morning we haven't done in over two years. We're going to greet one another. If you're not comfortable in greeting yet, that's okay. Just stand there with your hands down and just smile. But if you would like to, yeah, you can do that. Uh, (laughs) Allison just did that. Um, so, but uh, if you would like to greet one another, let's stand for a moment and you can move across the aisles and let's say hello to one another. It's good to greet everybody in the house of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>
thank you now, Lord, for the privilege of not only having the blessed assurance of knowing that you are our Lord and Savior of our lives, Father. We thank you for the gift that we'll never deserve, Father. We just thank you for that. And for us to be able to have not only the ability, but the freedom to tell your story, Lord. Let not one more minute go by without us sharing your love and the gift you've given us, Father. There are people who are dying in the Ukraine and they don't have another minute. We don't know how many minutes we have here. And Father, we just pray not only for those here in this church, Sumter, Sumter County, the state of South Carolina, and all across the United States and the world, Father. Not one more minute should go by without us being compelled to share your story, Father, and share your love and the blessing that you are to each one of us. We thank you for that. We pray that you be with this service today, Father, and that you would fill Nathan with the words that you would have him to say. Let us be able to receive it, Father, the way that you mean for us to hear it. We thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. What would you rather have? One million dollars or one person saved? When someone puts down Christianity, do you speak up or do you stay silent? What if your friend is down on life? Do you mention God or just tell them they'll be okay? Is it that hard to talk about God? We say we are Christian, but never put it into action. We all talk about how things should be done, but never act upon it. We are scared to be evangelists for the Lord. Today is the day to change. Put your pride aside, put your ego away, and spread the word of God for those who desperately need it. This world needs change and one small step will make a difference. It's very easy to talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Good morning. Are you ready to walk the walk? Are you ready to get your hands dirty and serve? The question I have this morning for you is, what if you were a missionary? Just imagine yourself for a moment as a missionary, okay? You just arrived in this new country. You're in the middle of a new culture. You're surrounded by a new language and possibly new values and new belief systems and a new worldview. What do you do? You're in the middle of all of that. What do you do? And everything is completely different, and you're the only one there that knows what you know, and everyone else is completely different. What would you do? How would you start your mission? How would you start um, God's work there? Hopefully you would start in prayer because that's always where you should start. But what would, how would you start to live in that moment? Um, would you adapt? Or how, how would you adapt? Would you try some new things to try to fit into your surroundings? Maybe try some new different things of the culture. Would you try different foods to try to fit in and realize what they eat? Would you try to learn the new language? Hopefully so. But then, would you try to blend in? And if so, how far? How far would you blend in? What if they had different, completely different beliefs, like I said before? Would you start to give up some of your beliefs, some of your morals, some of your worldviews to, in order to adapt and to fit into the surrounding people to try to uh, be relative to them? Would you do that? This may seem very far-fetched. I know some of you are like, well, I'm never going to be a missionary. I'm not called to that. That's, that's not what God's called me to do. I'll never do that. I don't plan to do anything like that. But what if I told you we already are? Well, you live in the United States of America in 2022. We are not living in the same ideology, beliefs, and worldviews that we are that we believe. That is not what's being displayed on this country anymore. It is what that is what it's like to live in the United States of America in 2022 nowadays. It is like living in a missionary field on the front lines. I sympathize with a lot of the elderly in here because they knew what it was like 50, 60 years ago. For some of them, 80 years ago. They know what it's like. For Ms. Irma Beck, she knew what it was like to come over here from, a, from Germany to come into the United States. And she was like fascinated with the United States. She knew what that was like. They grew up in a country that was completely patriotic. They knew what it was like to work hard 
and to serve each other. They know what it's like to have abortion and homosexuality was not celebrated. Transgender was not even a word or a thing that you even thought of. They didn't even have cuss words on the songs and the radios. It was banned. Now you hear them all the time. Girls and guys dress modestly, not trying to show as much skin as possible or reveal as much as possible as they do now. They lived in an era that family was very focused. Everything was very family focused. That people's schedule was based upon the church. Their friends were in the church, and it was not the opposite. The, inviting people to church back then was so easy because it was so relevant and so a part of their life. We don't live in that world anymore. We don't. I'm sorry. 2022, we do not live in that world anymore. And for these senior adults in here, it's like living in a foreign country. Their beliefs that they used to believe are not what's being displayed anymore. So how do you reach people for Jesus in today's time? In a world whose values and beliefs and morality and worldview is completely different than our own. In a world that is consumed with materialism, with vanity, and with selfishness. How do you reach people for Jesus in a world that even Christians don't want to go to church anymore? Ooh, think about that. Just three years ago, this place was pretty full. Now look around. Yeah, COVID. Yeah, you could say it's because of COVID. Okay. But is that the real reason? You know, we have online services for a good reason for those people who are sick. And I'm thinking of Barbara Scruggs right now that can't be around people because of her immunity. And that's fine. That's great. I'm glad we have those services. But what about those people that watch just to be watching and not ever stepping foot back into the church? We have Christians who don't want to go to church anymore. Pastor Charles and I were talking about another person in town that helped found a church. And because of travel ball, he admitted to Pastor Charles that he only is able to go one Sunday out of the whole month. So three out of four Sundays, he's on a ball field somewhere. Is that Christianity? Is that putting God first? I'm, I'm, I, I, that, is what we, that is where we are nowadays. So how do we reach people? And how do we serve God? It starts with you. It starts with you. I heard a saying, you know, maybe some people don't want to go to church just because of you. They see you and the way you act, and they're like, well, I don't want to be a part of that church. They're no different than I am. It has to start with us. It needs to start with you. Peter gives us full insight of how to reach a world, how to be godly in an ungodly world. And I want to read through this passage. I'm going to read the, the complete thing, and then I'm going to start breaking it down. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, he gives us insight of how to live godly in an ungodly world. So let's read it, starting with verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to, to be holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are chosen, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds 
and glorify God on the day he visits us. Would you pray with me, please? God, I've come to you this morning asking for your help in this message, Lord. As I too struggle with these things, I too struggle to put the first, the right foot forward in this passage. God, I pray, Lord, as we come together as people, as Crawsell Baptist Church, we come together. And God, I pray, Lord, that you allow us to hear the message you would want. Push me aside and let it be your message. May we learn how to be godly people in an ungodly world. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to do is I want to go back and break these things down. So let's go back to verse 4. And I want to start um, breaking it down like I said. It says in verse 4, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, Christ is our living stone. You see, each person, you, each and every single one of us, you and all the other people, they have a choice. You can either accept Christ or you can reject Christ. That's what this passage is saying. You can either accept him or you can reject him. The rejection in this passage refers to when people rejected Jesus and they crucified Jesus. But we too crucify Jesus every time we sin. And we have the option or the the choice to either accept him or to reject him. Now, going back to the very beginning of the verse, it says the word come. It says come. Come. To the living stone. Come is also, it is referring to the initial salvation. Anyone who wants to come to Jesus will, um, will be uh, rewarded the salvation that Christ offers. They will be granted that. They will be given that, but they have to come. If you are here and you have never come to Jesus, may this be the day that you do it and not put it off any longer. Come to Jesus, the living stone, because he is the one that gives life. But it's also referring to a continuous basis. We need to come, even as Christians, to Jesus. We need to draw near to Jesus. You see, in the Old Testament, they had priests before Jesus came and he, he died on the cross and broke that barrier down. And before the Holy Spirit came, they had priests that people had to go to in, in order to uh, speak with God. And it was the priest who went on their behalf to God. Well, now under the new covenant, through Jesus, we no longer have to worry about that. We don't have to go to a priest to do that. We now can enter in God's presence ourselves through Jesus Christ. So come to Jesus, come into his presence. You can be with Jesus, so draw near to him. You wanna change the world? You wanna change this ungodly world that we're living in? You need to come to Jesus and accept his offer of salvation through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And and Christians, you need to come back to your first love. Come back to your first love, as it says in Revelation, as John said that. We can't change the world until we ourselves come to the feet of Jesus. It starts with us, and we allow him to be Lord and Savior of our life. Pastor Charles says this all the time. It's not about accepting Christ as God. You need to allow him to be Lord and Savior of your life, Lord of your life. You no longer exist, as Colossians says. You are given a new life, and this new life should be governed and should be guided by his Holy Spirit. Verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering special sac- or spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The decision to believe in Jesus Christ admits someone into a, like a spiritual program, a spiritual building, all right? When someone comes to Christ, the living stone, a new stone is then added into the spiritual building. That spiritual building is the church, God's global church. So as soon as you accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, you become a stone in God's spiritual building, the church. Together, we function as a holy priesthood. This holy priesthood is guided by the Holy Spirit. 
Every Christian has immediate and direct access to God through Jesus Christ and serves God personally by bringing others to God. And it's through his church that we do that, that's guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, it also mentions some spiritual sacrifices that we need to make. Now, some of the Old Testament spiritual sacrifices that are mentioned in the, in the Bible are prayer. Yes, take time to pray. Another one is thanksgiving. Not only when we pray, but we also should be living a life that is thankful and living in that state of just thanksgiving. We should be praising God. That is what this is all about up here this morning, just praising God through worship songs. But it's also about repentance. And repentance is not going to God and asking for forgiveness and then going back out and doing the same thing again. Repentance, true repentance, is when you do a 180, not a 360, a 180. You, you re- confess your sins, you realize it was wrong, and you turn and walk the other way. But then Jesus comes, and he adds into the new covenant, and he adds, not adds, or not changes, but he also adds to the spiritual sacrifices. The first one being our bodies to God. Our bodies should be a sacrifice to God. Do you hear that? You do not own your body. Your body's no longer yours. I hear this all the time. Well, I can do what I want. It's my body. No, your body is not God. You sacrifice it the moment that you give your life to Christ. It is God's. You recognize that this body is just temporary and it's borrowed. It's not yours. We are to be living sacrifices, as Paul tells us in Romans. The second is financial gifts. Sacrifices. Financial gifts. Some of us may be doing some financial gifts that's easy. Is that a true sacrifice? Sacrificing through your financial gifts is you're going, God, this is going to, I feel like you're wanting me to do this. I'm feeling led by the Spirit to give this. So I'm giving it regardless of what amount it is. That's what's true sacrifice when you give because you felt led by the Spirit. And when the Spirit leads you to give, go ahead and give it because he already knows in advance that he's going to take care of you. Even if it's a sacrifice, he's going to take care of you in the end. So don't worry about it. Last, as Allison was touching on with her children's sermons so beautifully this morning, sacrificing by loving others. Now, how is that a spiritual sacrifice? Because let's be honest, some people are hard to love. And if you just nodded and said that, and you're pointing fingers like, yeah, that person is, remember, you got some other fingers pointing back at you. Are you hard to love? Focus inward. Loving can be a sacrifice. We need to love others through our service. Service. So in summary, the New Testament is pretty much when you give a sacrifice that requires your body, your money, and of your time. But I have such a busy schedule. Sacrifice. Give of your time for the church, for God's global church, for his glory. Moving on to verse 6 through 8, Peter does something really cool here. So let's look at it. He says, for in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Sion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone and the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. See, what Peter did here is he weaves together Isaiah um, chapter 28, verse 16, and Psalm one, chapter 118, verses 22, to express the point that Jesus is our cornerstone. He is the central piece to the spiritual building, the spiritual building, God's church. It is Jesus who is the cornerstone, the central piece to this church. He is the central piece to every Christian, should be. But he also reminds us that we can reject him that some will reject him. What about you? Are you allowing Christ to be the cornerstone in your life? He is the foundation cornerstone in your life. Is he the centerpiece in your life that everything else revolves around? Not having this and over here and this over here and this over here. No, the central piece that everything revolves around should be Christ. And then from there you go out. Is he really your cornerstone? Because if he's not, This emperor that you're trying to build, this building that you're trying to build all on your own, away from God and away from Christ, and him not being your cornerstone, that building will crumble. 
Without Christ being the cornerstone, your building that you're trying to build up called your life, it will crumble eventually. End of verse 8. Let's look at that. It says, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. I'll be honest with you. I struggled with this verse for a little bit because of that word destined for. So let's look at it. It says, they stumble because they disobey the message. I'm, I just told you, you don't have cornerstone. You don't have Christ as your cornerstone. You will stumble. And I, I'll go one step further. You will crumble because you disobey. Without the Holy Spirit, God, in your life, you will disobey because of your selfish desire. Your flesh will make you disobey because the flesh wants what it wants. And that's where our world is right now, is it not? Let's do whatever the flesh desires, whatever feels good, whatever feels right. That's what is morally correct nowadays. And it will lead us to a path to destruction. This country is going to fall unless we fall back to the feet of Jesus. Now let's look at that destined for. This is not to be confused with predestination. It's not what they were predestined for, okay? God didn't choose them to fall. They were destined to fall. All because if you don't have Christ in your life, the destiny of you, you will fall. If Christ is not your cornerstone, that your destiny is you will fall. Verse nine, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. We are chosen. Did y'all read that with me? That is not a mistake in the God's word. You are chosen. Now, again, this is not to be confused with predestination as well. All right. God has chosen us all. God has chosen each and every one of us, but he does give us a choice whether to accept or reject. We are all chosen and we are all called. You, you, we are all priests. I want you to hear that for a second. We are all priests. Now, what did I say in the beginning with the priests? Priests were the ones that people went to in order to, on behalf of the people, they went to God. We are all priests because we can go to God and and be in his presence because of Jesus Christ. So therefore, we are all priests. You are all priests. If you have Christ in your life, anyone in here today that claims that they are a Christian You are a priest, and you are part of a royal priesthood. Now, think about the responsibility and the implications of that. You are a royal priesthood. We are all called to those spiritual sacrifices, as I mentioned before. Because we, because of Christ and what he did for us, when we can be in his presence, we are now called to those spiritual disciplines that I mentioned before. Are, we are to be sacrificing with our body. We are to be sacrificing with our money. And we are to be sacrificing with our time by serving and loving each other. But then we also have individual callings. And this is what I really want to touch on. Yes, we are all have a calling to serve and love people and to love God and to give him all of the, give God all of the glory. That is your main calling. But then we have individual callings. And what's really cool is my calling is completely different than Pastor Charles's calling, even though we're both on staff here. Allison and Lauren's, even though they're both our children's ministers, Allison has a different calling than Lauren does. You have a different calling than anybody else in this. You have a different calling than anybody else. So stop trying to be like everybody else. Stop trying to be like the person that you want to be like. No, you be you. Your calling is, com- is completely different than anybody else. You can't have someone else's calling. It's not yours. God has a calling for your life that is different than the person that's sitting beside you. And keep in mind that when God calls you, I want you to hear this, when God calls you, keep in mind that he already knows and he already has in mind of who you are. That's why he called you. He created you for that calling. So he knows who you are. 
He knows your personality. He knows your talents and he knows your gifts. And that's why he's calling you to that specific thing. What is God calling you to do? It's no mistake that he's calling you, so don't run from it. You need to decide today if you're going to accept his calling or reject it for your life. There are some people in here who are gifted with children, and that could be a calling for your life. It's not my best place. That's why I'm not a children's minister, right? But that is why they are. They're really good with children. Maybe that's you. There are some people who are really good at caring for people. We have some great nurses in this congregation right now. There are some people who are called to be doctors. There are some people who love to argue, and they're called to be lawyers. You know, there, Everyone has a calling, and you can still use doctors, lawyers. Trash men are very vital. You can use those things for God's glory. And God's calling you to do those things for God's glory. But we are all called to become more like Christ and glorify him with our lives. We are his royal priesthoods. We are not, now this royal priesthoods, we are not called to be consumers. We are not called to be entertained. We are called to be living sacrifices. This life we have is a gift from God. We are called to give that life back to him. We aren't, we aren't meant to sit idle by and let the years pass as we become more self-absorbed. That's not what God called us to do. There are some, as it said in the video, would you give, would you want a million dollars or one person saved? Would you, which one would you rather have? That hits home. There are some who have just come in on Sunday mornings for an hour and then they're done for the rest of the week until the next Sunday morning. There are some, let's just be real and honest, there are some who come in on Sunday morning to worship God for an hour and they're done for a month, right? That is not who we're called to be. We're, we're called to be a part of this church. We're called to be a part of this royal priesthood. We are called to, be, to serve and we are called to love each other. We are called to be in community as we now are part of the spiritual building, the church, we are meant and called to be a part of this church. It is through community that we become stronger. And it is through community that we become more like Christ. And it is through community that we become the light or the beacon for this world, this ungodly world that needs God. When we start coming in unison and we start recognizing that this person has a gift for that and that person has a gift for that and we start blending it together, that's when the world starts looking in at us and going, huh, that's different. I want to be a part of that. Because here's the real deal. Christ is contagious. Christ is love and Christ is salvation. Christ is mercy. When people hear about that, it is contagious. They want that. We, as a body of Christ, need to be on unison of that and sharing it more and more with people. There are some things that our members are doing that I want to take time and just mention it to some, because there are some things that members are doing that they don't, actually don't even want credit for. But because we're on staff and because we hear and we work with you guys or we, we're, we're interacting with you guys, you tell us, well, this person did this, this person did that. Let me tell you some things so you can be thinking about, well, how can I serve the church? How can I serve the church? I'm not good at being on stage. You don't have to be to serve in the church. Here are some things that some of our members are doing that I want to mention because it might throw it out there for you. Some of our members provide meals for others in the church. Do you like to cook? Do you like to serve? And do you like to be a giver? You can provide meals. Some of our members visit shut-ins in nursing homes on a regular basis to kind of keep them informed because they used to be a part of the inside building of this church, but they still are a part of our church family. These people recognize that and they reach out to them to kind of keep them informed. They help out, some other people help out with elderly neighbors. Think about it. Who is your elderly, who is your neighbor and how can you be serving them as well? We have some who take people to the doctor's appointments and hair appointments because they can't drive. So we have other members who help them get to those things. That's vital. We have some who shop groceries for others who can't get out. 
We have some that do small repairs on homes. Is that you? Can you be doing those things? And that's just the little small things. I asked Pastor Charles this week, I kind of did an interview with him, and just to kind of sum it up, I said, what is something that you wished our church did a little bit more of? Just one thing. And just one thing that we were talking about, he said this, it is that we would reach out to others in fellowship. I was like, really, fellowship? It is through fellowship, Pastor Charles said, it is through fellowship that we learn how we can serve each other, how we can pray for them, how we can comfort them, and how we can celebrate with them, and how we can serve them. It is through fellowship that we learn how to do these things for the body of Christ. But without that, you don't know how to serve others because you don't know them. We're going to start providing some fellowships in the upcoming months. I hope and pray that you prayerfully consider to be a part of those fellowships and not just blow them off. Men tonight, I really hope that you come back tonight and be a part of that fellowship. Is, what is it going to be? It's just going to be a fellowship. Well, there's no Bible study? No. But it is through fellowship that God's Word can be illuminated. I mean, seriously, we can bond with each other. We can become united through fellowship, and that is why fellowship becomes so vital. Here's the real deal. We just did a greeting just a little minute ago. There are some of you that are on this side that see people on this side every week and vice versa, and in the middle, you see each other, but do you know each other? It is through fellowship that we do these things and we learn who each other is. Youth, I challenge all of you because we have some great minds in this church. Get to know some of the senior citizens in this church. Youth, I'm challenging you. I'm not, you don't wait for them to come to you. Youth, I'm telling you, you go to them. Learn who they are. Learn what they, can, what they have done and learn from the, their wisdom. Verse 10, we're going to close out on this. Verse 10, it says, Once you were not a, a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from simple desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. Because we have been shown mercy and grace and we have repented, we as Christians are to act differently from this world. I want you to really hear that from Peter. We are to act differently from this world. We are to be strangers, foreigners, exiles of this world, as he said. Some translations say aliens and strangers, right? We are to be different. Look at your own life. How close do you resemble the world? If people looked at you, how close would they see worldly things in your life? We are to abstain from all of those things. We are to abstain from our sinful desires and seek out God's desires. We are to seek out our calling. We are his royal priesthood, and we are to be serving God and serving others. We are to be set apart. This world tells you to look at yourself and be concerned about yourself, and that's it. No. Reach out. Yourself is last. We are to be reaching out and helping others through the, to fulfill your calling. So the invitation today, I'm going to kind of let God do his work, and I want you to respond how you feel led. But are you willing to accept Christ today? Are you going to reject him one more time? Are you willing to accept his calling upon your life? There are some of you who has been running from his calling for a long time. It's time to give that up because you are never going to be fulfilled and have a purpose and be, you will be completely miserable until you surrender to the calling. And that calling as a Christian is living for God, seeking him first. Let him be the cornerstone of your life and accepting his desires, not yours, for your life. There are some of you who are constantly seeking out your own desires, even though you call yourself a Christian, and you say you glorify God. It's time that you start glorifying God with your life. Start glorifying God with your choices. Are you ready to join God's community? Be a part of the spiritual place. Are you ready to serve this church? Serve this church and not just be a part of it.
I pray that you, be, you, you start serving this church and you start seeing Crawsell Baptist Church as family instead of just a place that you go to on Sunday. Because we are family. And we want every single one of you to be a part of this family. Would you pray with me? God, Lord, we lift up these things this morning. And God, we lift up, God, we really lift up our lives to you. And God, I pray, Lord, that if there's something that's holding us back from giving our all, from seeking you out completely, that's not allowing you to be the true cornerstone. God, if we put something else as a cornerstone in our life, that you would remove it and you become the true cornerstone in our life so that way we won't won't crumble. But God, I also pray for this church that you will be the cornerstone of this church. And God, I pray for individuals in here as Christians and families in here as, God, that we start serving this church more. So God, I pray, Lord, now that in this time of invitation that you act and you move. God, you convict us where we need to be convicted, but also, Lord, that you're glorified. That you're glorified through the choices that we make. But God, I pray that if there's someone in here, that they will accept you and accept their calling on their life instead of rejecting you one more time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.